بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Continuing in the chapter, the description of the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Babu Sifati Salat al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The author, he mentions several narrations and from them he says Rahimahullahu Ta'ala An Abi Qatadat al-Ansari Radiyallahu Anhu Anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Kana Yusalli Wa Huwa Hamilun Umamata Binta Zainaba Binti Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ولي أبي العاصي ابن الربيع ابن عبد الشمس فإذا سجد وضعها وإذا قام حملها The author he mentioned the narration of, uh, of Abu Qatadata al-Ansari رضي الله عنه that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم that he would pray while carrying أمامة بنت زينب بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم that he would pray while carrying أمامة Umama, she is the daughter of Zainab, which is the daughter of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she likewise is the daughter of Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi ibn Abd shams That is her father. And her mother is Zainab bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that means that Umama radiyallahu anha, she is the granddaughter of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would carry her in the prayer. And uh, whenever he would make sujood, he would put her down. And whenever he would stand, he would carry her. And this is the narration the author, he had mentioned. Rahimahullahu ta'ala. Abu Qatadata uh, radiyallahu anhu, his name is Al-Harith ibn Rib'i al-Ansari al-Khazraji. رضي الله عنه and he is known as فارس رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فارس meaning the, the horseman or the knight of the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم he was very well versed and experienced in riding horses and battling and the likes on horses and he was from those who would travel with the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم and has been narrated that in one of the travels, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is riding and he was, had fallen asleep and he began nodding off. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu wa barakatuhu alayhi. And uh, Abu Qatadata radiallahu anhu, he noticed that and he eased up onto the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his horse. And he put his uh, his self beside the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, going beside him, propping him up so he did not fall. And he did that in a gentle manner, in a manner that did not wake the Prophet And he continued like that for some time. And then the Messenger وسلم, he woke up and uh, he asked uh, Abu Qatadata about how long he had been there. And he mentioned, radiyallahu anhu, and then the Prophet وسلم, he said to him, Hafidhakallahu bima hafidhta nabiyahu. May Allah preserve you and protect you in the manner that you have protected his prophet. In the manner that you have protected his prophet. Abu Qatadata radiallahu anhu, he witnessed the battle of Uhud and the battles after that likewise. And he died in Medina radiallahu anhu in the year 54 after the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here he is narrating that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would carry Umamata bint Zainab, bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umama bint Zainab. She is Umama to bint Abil As ibn Rabi'. She is likewise the daughter of, of Zainab. Bint Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Zainab, she is the oldest da- of the daughters of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's been mentioned that she was born whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was approximately 30 years old. Her father, Abu al-As, his name is Laqiyat ibn al-Rabi' and he married uh, Zainab radiallahu anha before the coming of prophethood by a short period, by a short period. But uh, for some time he remained upon disbelief and Zainab radiallahu anha, she accepted Islam and likewise she migrated 
and she left uh, she left her husband behind upon his shirk and upon disbelief and she migrated uh, with those who migrated radiallahu anha but it is mentioned about uh, about him about Abu al-As his name is Laqith ibn al-Rabi' radiallahu anhu that likewise he accepted Islam in the seventh year in the seventh year of the Hijrah and at this time he migrated as well to Al-Madina and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam returned the, the marriage back to him and back to Zainab and he established that marriage that was established before before Al Islam. After he accepted Islam, then his marriage was given back and the contract was uh re established and made valid. Zainab radiallahu anha, she died in the eighth year of the Hijrah and uh Um Atiyah and other women from the Sahabiyat they uh, washed her radiyallahu anha wa an sahabati ajma'in and likewise uh, abul as he died in the year 12 after the hijra of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as for umama who was uh, a baby and a small child at the time at this time in the life of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam later uh, in her life uh, ali radiyallahu anhu ali ibn abi talib he married umama at the advice of Fatima. He married Umama after the death of Fatima with her advice and her wasiyah uh, that he should marry Umama bin Zainab uh, anhuma. So these are our narrators and those who are in this narration. Abu Qatada he says uh, anhu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yusalli wa huwa hamilun umamata. بنت زينب بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولي عبد العاصي ابن الربيع ابن عبد الشمس that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم he would he would pray while carrying Umama while carrying Umama and some narrations on his neck and other narrations on his shoulder صلى الله عليه وسلم while carrying Umama which is the daughter of Zainab who is the daughter of the messenger of Allah and her father is Abu العاصي ابن الربيع ابن عبد الشمس Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu, he says, فَإِذَا سَجَدَ وَضَعَهَا وَإِذَا قَامَ حَمَلَهَا That whenever he would make sujood, he would put her down. And whenever he would stand, he would carry her. And he put her back uh, on his shoulder, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He would put her back on his shoulder, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some wordings of this narration in uh, Sahih Muslim, it said, كَانَ يَأُمُّ النَّاسِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was leading the people in prayer. He was leading the people in prayer. So there are many benefits from this narration and from them is that it is permissible to move in this manner and the type of movement like we will see here uh, in the prayer. And that does not invalidate the prayer. The movement like this, carrying a child, picking it up and putting it down, this does not invalidate the prayer. And likewise, and likewise movements that are similar to that as well, the, this also does not invalidate the prayer. And uh, this is with regards to the obligatory prayer and the non-obligatory prayer. And likewise, this is with regards to whether it is the imam who is moving like this or the one who is praying behind the imam, yani al ma'mum, or whether it is an individual praying uh, by himself, the munfarid. Uh, this ruling is included in all of them, that uh, light movements in the prayer and movements like this in this manner, this does not invalidate the prayer, uh, walhamdulillah. And uh, also, from uh, the benefits of this narration, we see that it's permissible to carry children. And the salah, and that this is something that is allowed, and this is something that's permissible. The people of knowledge they mention here in either statement of Abu Qatada, كان يصلي وهو حامل أمامة, that he used to pray while he's carrying Umama, sallallahu alayhi wa This it, it is mentioned about this narration that this occurred one time, that this occurred one time. So this is not something that he would do always, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But this is something that occurred, and this is uh, to clarify the permissibility of this affair. And uh, one would uh, carry the child in the prayer whenever one has need for that. If it is needed, then one can carry the child and there's no blame on him and this is permissible and good, alhamdulillah. But as for the purpose and the intent from the prayer, it is for the heart to be focused and to have khushu' and humility and humbleness. And no doubt that carrying a child and, and the likes like this would disturb a believer and could turn him away from that humbleness. And this is the goal from the from the prayer. And establish the prayer for my remembrance. 
But if a parent or a guardian was in need or in a certain situation and the likes like this, then it's permissible. But it's not something that a believer will try to do all the time, but rather a believer will try to strive to have khushur and humbleness and humility and the presence of mind in the prayer. And a believer likewise will avoid everything and stay away from everything that would distract him in the prayer. But if there is a situation whenever an individual is in need to carry a child like this or to make some slight movements like this, then this is permissible and this is allowed and this is from the ease in and the deen, alhamdulillah. Likewise, from the benefits of this narration, we see that uh, the fundamental principle and issue with regards to the clothing of children and their bodies, yani of small children, is that uh, their clothing is uh, tahir, and likewise their bodies is tahir, yani tahara, tahara tu thiabi al athfali wa ajsamihim. And this is in the case uh, in the origin, and yani this is the original ruling and issue that their clothing is pure and clean and uh, free of najasa, and likewise their bodies. Unless it is established and uh, known with certainty that there is najasa there. At this time, one will not carry the child. If it, if there, if it is known that there is najasa on the child, or there is najasa on the, 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 the clothing of the child, at this time, one will not carry the, the child in the prayer. At this time, one will not carry the child in the prayer. As for in the case that it is not known, one is not established, and one is not certain that there is najasa on the child, then it's permissible to, ch- to carry him in the in the prayer. And the origin is that there is no najasa there, not on him, or not on his body, or not on the, 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 the body of the child, and not on the clothing. But as for if it is established and known that there is najasa there, then it is not permissible to carry the child in the salah at this time. And Allah knows best. Likewise, from this narration, we see the noble manners of the Prophet ﷺ and his humbleness. And likewise, his kindness, especially for, for the children, that he would carry, that, and to, to clarify this issue, that he would humble himself and he would carry a child, a little girl in the prayer, a small girl, and he, he would carry her like this in the prayer. And this is from his mercy and rahmah and kindness, and likewise showing uh, concern for the, the parent uh, of the child as well, that uh, the Prophet, he would come out and he would carry the child, and he would carry uh, the, the the little girls in this manner, especially in those days whenever many of the Arab, they would uh, refuse to carry the girls. And they had a dislike for the females. And uh, it is known that some of them would even bury, and that it, ha- that it happened from the Arabs, that some of them would even bury the, the females alive as the, if they had the female ch- children. And the likes like this. And many of them, they disliked to carry, to even carry, if they kept the child, they wouldn't like to carry the, the, the female child. But here the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not only did he carry her, but rather he carried her in the, in the Salah. He carried her in, in the Salah. Also from this narration, we see the benefit that it is allowed to bring children into the Masjid. And uh, this is permissible, that the children, they can come in the Masjid. But the people of knowledge, they mentioned that this is with the condition that they do not harm the people, nor disturb the people. So if the child is going to be brought into the masjid, and then he is left to wander around and to run circles around the people praying, and the likes like this, then this is not allowed. It is not allowed to come to the masjid and to disturb the people. And a believer should fear Allah that he would ever disturb the people while they're trying to worship Allah or be a means, him or anyone from his family, to be a means to disturb the people and to uh, and to bring problems into the masajid and the likes like this. And this is something that I believe he'll be concerned about. That if he is in need, if, if he is in need to bring the child to the prayer and to the masjid, he can do that and it's allowed for him. But he should keep the child close to him and he should keep the child under control and he should make sure that the child does not disturb the people especially at the time during the prayer especially at the time during during the prayer so with regards to bringing the children in the masjid this is allowed but many of the people do not recommend it and those who are not able to to control their children or their children are able to be still in the lights like this or to be quiet then it is not recommended to bring them. But rather, if a person, he brought them out of need or necessity, then this is fine and this is permissible. But it's not something that one should do all the time and he, unless he has a need for that. Unless he has a need for that. And uh, likewise, there is another uh, mistake that some of the people make with regards to bringing the children in the masjid. And that is that there will be a child who is not of the age of Tamiz. He's not uh, at the age of seven or eight. 
and the lights like this were above that, and they will stand him in the prayer with no wudu, standing him beside him in the prayer. And uh, this is not correct. And uh, the child who was not of the age of Tamiz, and he does not know how to pray, and he has, and he does not have wudu, and the lights like this, he will not stand in the row, in the ranks with the men in the prayer. And uh, th this is in reality cutting off the ranks. And this is in reality cutting off the ranks and placing a gap in, in the ranks. And uh, this is not correct. But rather he will carry him or set him in front of him or the likes like this or ask him to sit against the wall uh, and wait uh, silently and quietly in this manner. In this manner. As for standing the child in the ranks whenever he's two, three, four, five years old and he does not have wudu and he does not know how to pray or anything like this. He's not of the age of Tamiz. He, he can't even have an intention and the likes like this. And this is just making a gap in the rank and disturbing the people and disturbing the people. As for the case if the child has reached the age of a Tamiz, and the people of knowledge, they mention approximately the age of seven. At this time, it's allowed for him to make wudu and to be taught how to pray and to stand in the rank. And to stand in the rank. But as for before that, then uh, this is not correct. This is not correct. So the believer should, should be aware of these affairs and show honor and respect. And respect for the masajid and for the worshippers and the, and the believers in the masajid. And show respect and honor for the prayer. And uh, perform this uh, affair properly and in the correct manner. We see from uh, this narration that the main benefit with regards to this, the people of knowledge, they mention the, uh, the issue of moving in the prayer. The issue of having movement in the prayer. And we see here no doubt that carrying a child in the prayer and putting it down for ruku' or for sujood and picking it back up and so on and so forth, this is uh, uh, a lot of movement. But at the same time, this movement was done by the best of, of mankind. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, the people of knowledge, they discuss the issue here. Masala al-haraka fi salat Masala tu al-harakati fi salat And the people of knowledge, they mention that al-haraka tu fi salati arba tu aqsam. That moving in the prayer is four, is four types. Moving in the prayer, having movement in the prayer is four different types or four different categories and the first one is the type that will that would invalidate the prayer the first the first type of movement in the prayer is a type of movement that would invalidate the prayer and it is the type of movement that is considered a lot and it is consecutive and continuous a lot of movement in the prayer that is consecutive and continuous without any need whatsoever this type of movement will will, will uh, invalidate the prayer. Somebody who's moving constantly, w without a need, and it's consecutive and continuous movement, then this type of movement will invalidate the prayer. And some of the people of knowledge, they mentioned that type of movement is like whenever a person, if he were to see an individual moving so much that he would not even think that he's praying. They would see the person make, making so much movement, yani, that is not related to the prayer whatsoever. And the likes like this, that he would move in this manner, and somebody would look at him and think that he's not even praying. That this type of movement, this type of movement invalidates the prayer, and the prayer will become invalidated uh, because of this uh, type of movement in the prayer. Yani, they say al haraka al kathira al mutawariya ligairi darura ligairi darura to have a lot of movement, a lot of movement that is consecutive, that is continuous, without having any need or necessity. This type of movement in the prayer will invalidate it. This type of movement in the prayer will invalidate it. The second type of movement in the prayer, the people of knowledge, they mentioned that it is the movement that is disliked. It is the movement that is disliked. And this is to have light movement. You know, not a lot of movement, but rather a light movement. This one, it does not invalidate the prayer, but it is disliked. Not a lot of movement, but rather light movement. But they mention here, without a need. There's no need for it. Like the one who is playing with his beard or playing with his clothing or or moving around uh, in the prayer, and moving his hand, or picking at his hair, and the likes like this. And he, he has no need uh, to uh, move, he's just moving around. And the likes like this, that this type of movement, that is uh, a little considered a little bit, but uh, there's no need for it. This type of movement is disliked. This type of movement is disliked. It does not invalidate the prayer, but it is, it is disliked. The third type of movement in the prayer, it is not disliked. It is not disliked, and nor is it recommended. And it's not disliked, and nor is it recommended. And it is the type of movement that is light, but uh, there is a type of need. There's some type of need for it. Yani, some type of need for it. It's light. For example, somebody who has 
uh, an itch or the lice like this, and he needs to move his hand and yani, to uh, adjust something because he's uncomfortable, then this one is permissible. The people of knowledge, they mentioned, and he, there's a need for this, and it's light movement. It's not disliked, and it's not recommended. It's not disliked, and it's not recommended. As for the fourth type of movement in the prayer, then this is the type of movement that is recommended, or it could be considered obligatory. It is the type of it is the type of movement that is recommended, or it could be considered obligatory, and this is the movement that occurs for the benefit of the prayer. This is the movement that occurs for the benefit of of the prayer, or in order to establish something that is uh, commanded, or something that is good and permissible. Uh, and uh, this is, for example, to move up in the ranks. Uh, for example, if there is a person praying and then he left the prayer for some reason and there's a gap for a believer to step up into the rank, then this is recommended for him and to close the gap. And that he, that, that the believers, they should co close the gap. Either a person, he will step forward and close that gap or the, the individuals in that rank, they will scoot over and close that gap. In any case, even if a person were to step up from one rank to the next rank, which requires uh, a bit of movement for a person to step from one rank to the next, but in this uh, situation, it's for the benefit of the prayer to close the gaps in the prayer. So therefore, this is permissible and this is something that is good and allowed and, uh, and the likes like this. So therefore, at this time, uh, it is uh, permissible to move and uh, it is allowed to move. And it has come, and he, not only this narration here, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was uh, was moving in the prayer, carrying uh, Umamata radiyallahu anha, and putting her down and picking her up, but likewise it has been mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he opened the door for Aisha radiyallahu anha that he would be praying uh, one time, and uh, that he moved to open the door for Aisha, and likewise this is something that uh, is uh, permissible. And also, it has been narrated from the Prophet wasallam that he prayed one time, and he's leading the believers in prayer, and he would step up onto his minbar, and he would step up the stairs of the minbar, and he would pray standing on the minbar, so that people could see him. And this is during the prayer, and he would make the, the he would recite, the standing and the ruku' all on the minbar. And then whenever it's time for sujood, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would step back down the stairs and he would prostrate on the ground. And then he would go back up the stairs and, and complete his prayer in this manner. And this is, requires movement, but it is for the benefit of teaching the believers so they can see him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these types of movements, they do not invalidate the prayer. They do not invalidate the prayer. So the one who makes a lot of movement without necessity, this type of movement will... And a lot of movement that is continuous. And without necessity, this type of movement would invalidate the prayer. As for the one who moves a little here and there, and the likes like this, then this is disliked, and it does not invalidate the prayer. And as for the one who moves lightly, but it was for some type of need, then uh, the people of knowledge that this is mentioned that this is not uh, disliked, nor is it uh, recommended. And then there is uh, the issue of moving because of the benefit of the prayer for the benefit of the prayer. So therefore, at this time, it would be uh, recommended or even could become obligatory if it was for the sake of the benefit of the prayer or uh, for an affair that is commanded and it's something that one is ordered. For example, if a person were praying and then there is a child about to do something dangerous, like, for example, Riyadhu Billah put a, a fork or something in the socket then uh, the believer who will move and take the baby out of the way. And if he, if he uh, only required for him to move any, uh, briefly, and he did not turn away from the qibla, and so on and so forth, then uh, inshallah the prayer will be correct, and he could continue praying. But if the movement required for him to turn away from the qibla and the likes like this, and extreme movement in this manner, then at this time the prayer would be invalidated and he would have to return. But in any case, it would be allowed for him to do this, to, to, to save a person from danger. Uh, and the likes like this, and uh, Allah knows best, and Allah knows best. So we see that um, this narration has uh, many benefits, and uh, the the main uh, issue here is movement and the prayer, and uh, the people of knowledge have mentioned uh, the types of movement, and this has proceeded, and we close with that. Wallahu a'lam, wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.